Well, good morning, folks. I'm so glad you're with us for week three of our Sweet Dreams series here in the month of July. And we've been granting all kinds of dreams all over the place. It's pretty cool. Um, folks have, uh, have wished for gumballs and uh, trees out of their yard and power wash and lunch at work, Gatorades for their gym, all kinds of stuff that we've been glad to grant <coughs> at both of, our, both of our campuses. And so whether you're with us in Caswell or you're watching online, uh, we're just so glad that you're here with us for this week. And I'm really excited about this message. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, if you want to go ahead and turn there. And then I'll just tease you at the end. I'm also going to give you a verse from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Um, but we're going to be in Matthew 6, if you want to go there. And I'm really excited about the message because I think we can really create some freedom for you today. Um, <coughs> I really do think if we'll, if we'll heed what God is saying and we don't try to overcomplicate it today, I think that you can really get some freedom. Um, what we've been talking about in this series, just to kind of recap, and we don't have to recap week by week, it kind of builds on itself, and, but what we are talking about in the series is the things that keep us up at night, which are our fears. Um, but the things that keep us up at night aren't really about fear, they're about faith. They're not really about fear. It's not about, or the goal is not to fear less, but rather, how can I trust God more? And so what we're trying to do in the series is to understand that the fear is not what we focus on, and it's not like we're going to eliminate it, so we're not using God to eliminate that fear. What we're trying to do is build faith and build trust. And so it's not how do I fear less, but how do I trust God more? And that's what we're shooting for. And I really think today we can create some more trust and some more faith in God and less focus on the fears that we have. Um, <clears throat> like last week, we talked about the fear of the unknown. This week, I think we can kind of put to rest some of the fears of the future that tend to keep you up at night. Um, most Christians believe this. Most Christians believe that God has a will for our life or a plan for our life, and we want to follow that will or that plan. I mean, don't you agree? I think most Christians would agree that that's the case, that God has a plan for us. We use the term God's will for our life, and we want to follow that plan or that will. I think everybody would agree with it. And we often say, I want to be the sinner. I want to be at the center of God's will, or I want to live in the center of God's will, which sounds awesome coming out of our faces, but really nobody knows what the heck that means. And so we say that a whole lot, and yet nobody really knows what that means to live in the center of God's will. And I think it's probably because we've confused it quite a bit. A lot of believers are paralyzed. A lot of believers are losing sleep because they are afraid they're going to make a wrong decision and then be out of God's will. And so there's these decisions that are keeping you up at night that you have to make. And you're scared that you're going to take the wrong turn, you're going to take the wrong job, you're going to do the wrong thing, and then you're going to be out of God's will. In our current culture, there's more decisions to make now than there ever have been before. I mean, do you remember, when I was a kid, you did not choose what... Uh, what type of television you had at your home or how you saw your media. You had um, some bunny ears on the back of the TV, and the most choices you did was between Channel 2 and Channel 4. I mean, that was about it. And so uh, if you were the dad in the house, you might have had a few more choices because then you could make your kids, which is what happened to me, stand over there and hold the bunny ears while you got to watch whatever's on the television. I mean, but you weren't choosing very much. The, the culture that we live in today, there's so many more choices that we have. I mean, just think about the choices at the grocery store alone. It is crazy the amount of choices that you have at the grocery store. I remember when I was a kid, when you went to get milk, there was like one choice. You might have had two, but you didn't have very many more than that. Now there's all kinds of milk. I think about when I was a, a newly married guy, new husband, and, and Valerie sent me to the store. We've been married um, 19 years ago this month. And so she sent me to the store to get shampoo as a brand new husband. And I walk into the store, and I am shocked at the amount of shampoos and this was 19 years ago shocked and I have no idea what to get in terms of shampoo no clue what to buy because one I got married at 19 years old and so I was maybe 20 when this happened and my mama had always bought shampoo or we had just used soap right if you've seen my head you know that I use one bar of soap for all parts of my body it's always been that way and I remember looking at it and I didn't have a cell phone or anything back then we didn't have that so I couldn't call her to ask her and so I'm just staring at the shampoos until this lady comes over and I pick someone who's about the age of my wife and I'm saying I'm supposed to buy shampoo what do I get and then she gives it to me, and I go home. And, of course, as you know, I was wrong, right? Now, when she sends me to get stuff from the grocery store, we've got a system. She gives me a list. She gives me specifics. It even says how much the ounces are on it. And it includes a picture that I can look at on my phone to make sure I get it right. And yet still, 
I tend to get it wrong. But regardless, there's so many choices that are in our lives. I mean, just grocery store choices. I mean, that's just one example of it. Media choices that we can look at, um, <coughs> what we choose to do with our money and banking choices. I mean, there's, we're just inundated with those choices. And it's great to have choices, but it can also be kind of paralyzing. It's great to have a bunch of different things that you can choose from, but it can kind of paralyze you. It can kind of stagnate you. It kind of can blow you back, and you don't really know what to do with it. There's so many things keeping you up at night that are tied to a decision that you have to make. I think that, that there's a lot of restless nights that are tied to decisions that you have to make, and you're not sure whether it's in God's will or not as a Christ follower and so you just end up kind of sitting on the decision over and over and over again because you want to make sure that it's in God's will. Nobody escapes this decision-making process. I mean, it's, everybody's going to have to deal with it at some point. Is this decision that I have to make, is it where I'm supposed to go if you're not a Christ follower? If you are a Christ follower, is it in God's will? Is it in his plan for me? Am I going to mess his plan up? If we go back to that phrase, God's will for just a little bit today. That's what I want to talk to you about. I want us to clarify some understanding about God's will. This is one of the most confusing thoughts in all of Christianity. When you hear the term God's will, it is one of the most confusing thoughts in all of Christianity because you ask one group of Christians what it means and they got one answer. You ask another group of Christians what it means, you got another answer. And everybody likes to reference what I said in the beginning, living in the center of God's will, but nobody really knows what the heck that means. And so it's a really confusing phrase that we use quite frequently. The, the conventional approach to God's will, I want to lay out for you. You tell me if I'm, if I'm right or wrong, but I think I'm right. The conventional approach to God's will looks like this. Most Christians believe that God has a secret plan and direction for your life. And then it's your job to figure out the secret plan so you can live the life that God wants you to live. And so most Christians either believe this assumption about God's will or they're just living under this assumption. It's just something that we walk under, that God has this secret plan and will for our life. And it's there, but it's secret. And then it's our job to kind of figure that plan out so we can live in God's will or not live in God's will. And I think that's the conventional approach. And I think it creates a whole lot of stress that you don't need. And I think it can cre create a whole lot of restless, sleepless nights that you don't need. And I think for me, it has caused this a lot in my life. A lot of restless, sleepless, flipping over into bed nights where I'm trying to figure out if this decision that I'm going to make is in God's will or not. I remember doing this so much with this church specifically us moving into the uh, old YMCA, whether it was the right decision, whether it wasn't, whether we could do it, whether we couldn't. And, and it wasn't about whether it was the right decision. It was more so about whether it was in God's will for us as a church or not to do that. And I think it creates a lot of stress when we understand God's will as some secret plan that we've got to figure out. You know, it, it creates stress because if I figure out the plan, then I'm in God's will. So if I figure out the secret, then I'm, then I'm in God's will. But if I don't figure it out, then I've missed it. And now I'm out of God's will. So if I'm in God's will and I figure it out, then he blesses me. But if I miss it and I don't figure it out or I take the wrong step or he says, take this job and I didn't and I didn't figure out the secret plan, then I'm out of God's blessing and I'm out of God's will. And I think it gives you a whole lot of stress. So, so the question is, is, does God have a secret will and direction for your life? And there's a lot of people that are a lot smarter than me, that are going to disagree with what I'm about to say to you. Does God have this secret will and direction for your life? And so I would say to you, I do not believe that God has some secret path or direction that he expects you to find out and then follow. I do not believe he is sitting back with popcorn, waiting and watching to see if you find his mysterious will in this world. I don't think that he puts in front of us paths to take or there's decisions in front of us to either take this job or take this job, move to this city, move to that city, do this particular thing, do this particular thing, and then he's sitting back with a big bowl of God-sized popcorn, which would be huge, right? Sitting back with some huge popcorn, and it would be cheddar popcorn because that's the best. Going, let me just see if he figures this out. Let me just see if she figures this out. I don't believe it. That understanding of God's will is unbiblical, and it's a recipe for paralysis. It is a recipe for you to sit around paralyzed and not knowing what to do and fear to set in. And I don't think any part of God's recipe includes us to be paralyzed with any sort of fear. 
And so I think when we believe God's will in that way, it's completely unbiblical first off, but then it leads us to being paralyzed with fear. What we need to realize is that we, while we are free to ask God for wisdom, there's never a moment that God burdens us with trying to figure out the direction for our life ahead of time. He's not burdening you with that. While we can ask him for wisdom, there's not this time where he's expecting you to figure out the direction of your life ahead of time. I'm not saying that God doesn't have a plan. Don't say that I said that. I'm not saying that he isn't going to help you make decisions. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, is stop thinking about God's will as some magic eight ball or a crossword puzzle or a corn maze that you've got to get through. By the way, you can say what you want to about cro magic eight balls and crossword puzzles and corn mazes, but corn mazes ain't fun. And so, so you probably had a friend that is taking you to a corn maze and said how much fun it is. It ain't no fun at all. You walk around in corn, and it's made and set up specifically to trick you. And so you end up kind of trying to figure your way out, and you're in there with a crowd of people, and then kids are just zigzagging through the corn all the time, breaking it up, and then you'll get to a spot, I don't know if you've known this, you get to a spot in the corn maze where you think it's a direction, and really it's just some kids fell down, right? And so it's just tricky. I don't think corn mazes are fun at all, and so what I think we need to do when it comes to God's will is stop thinking about it as something we've got to magically figure out. I don't think that that's the case at all. When we believe this about God's will, we believe that God's will is this secret plan and the burden is on us to figure it out. It's like he's playing a game with you with a bunch of dead ends that you have to figure out. And I don't think that's the case at all. And I think that that's probably causing a lot of us to lose a lot of sleep. There is a lot more freedom in the Christian walk than you think there is. There is a lot more freedom in the life that Jesus has died to provide us with. I'm not talking about your earthly, just physical life. I'm talking about the life that Christ died to give you. There is a lot more freedom in it than we think. And what we typically do as Christians as we walk, where we begin to make errors, is when we start to really limit the freedom that we have in Jesus. And one of the ways we do that is with our understanding of God's will. You are not one decision away from falling out of God's will as far as your future goes. You're not one step away, you know, if you take this wrong job in this wrong town for this time period, you have not just fallen out of God's will as far as your future is concerned. You're not one step away from it. And so that thing that's keeping you up at night on what decision to make based on this, and you're thinking, well, that's going to get me out of God's will, you're not one step away from that. The teachings in the Word are unbelievably simple about God's will. I mean, unbelievably simple. So what I would say to you is what I was warning to, uh, to you about at the beginning of the message. Don't complicate this. This is going to appear like the, mo the, the simplest message. I was about to say the most simplest. And maybe that works good. The most simplest message Adam Cook has ever preached is what you're going to feel like you're going to hear today. Do not try to complicate it. What we said in the Titus series is just because something is simple does not mean it's easy. And so what I want you to kind of focus on as we jump into this in Matthew 6 in just a second is do not complicate this because what the teachings of the word are on God's will are incredibly simple. And look, let me, give you a, let me give you a hint. Let me kind of spoil it for you. It has nothing to do with the future. When we talk about God's will, it has nothing to do with the future. It has everything to do with today. It does not have to do with the future. That right there, before we even get to preaching on it, is to free you a little bit. Then maybe you won't lose as much sleep on figuring out if you're in God's will or not over the decisions that you have to make. It has nothing to do with the future. Let's jump into Matthew 6, and we're going to go through this relatively fast. 25 through about 32, and then we're going to pause, and we're going to read 33 and 34. Now, you can't do a series on fear and worry um, without preaching this scripture. Uh, this is the quintessential anxiety scripture. And so if you are one of my fellow anxietyites, that's what I've named you, and you tend to fall into a lot of anxiety all the time, um, hopefully you have found Matthew 6, 25. Hopefully. If not, you just found your life verses. Um, because you're going to read these constantly as someone who struggles with anxiety. Let me read you 25 through 32 all together. I'll try not to stop, but that never really works out. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? I'm not going to talk about these specifically. I just want you to feel the overall sense 
I, I want you to pick up what Jesus is putting down through this whole set of Scripture. Don't get caught up in trying to figure out whether that statement's true or not. You know it is as soon as you read it. Just kind of move past it and just get the overall feel of it. Where did I stop at? I think 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? This is probably the only place I'm going to pause. I'll probably lie. This is a um, rhetorical question, right? So if you're sitting there right now going, am I more valuable to God than birds? Yes, that's why you eat them for dinner, all right? Yes, you are. And sometimes I think maybe you have to go back to the Word to hear something that you should have heard as a kid. Um, maybe you have to go back to the Word to find something that your parents should have told you or that people loved you should have told you. And so some of you, you've never really heard or been told that you're valuable. And so I want you to kind of hear from the word right here, and we don't have a lot of time to talk about it, is, yes, you are much more valuable than this, and look how awesome they're taken care of is the gist that Jesus has given us. Look at the next verse. <clears throat> can, not, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon, the, greatest, the richest man that's ever lived, right, with the most clothes and splendor and everything else, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the fields, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, which means it's extremely temporary, right, extremely temporary, if, if it's here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Ah, we get to something right there with that you of little faith part, don't we? We get to that the, the fears of the future are really just centered in your lack of faith. The, the fears of decision making and what's going to happen in the future and if it's in God's will or not are much more centered in your lack of faith than they are in the fear of that. Watch 31. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, those people that don't know God. They run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Let's pause here for a second. What's Jesus saying? Jesus is very clearly saying, if you want to get to the main point of Matthew 6, 25 through 32, here's the main point. Don't spend so much time worrying about the future. It's from Jesus. It's not from me. I'm not making it up. Don't spend so much time worrying about the future, especially this holy worry where you're worried about being in God's will. Don't spend so much time about worrying of those decisions and those things about the future stuff that's in your life, especially that holy worry. What's keeping you up at night? What's keeping you up at night? You are living out the future before it gets here. That, my friends, is the definition of anxiety. You are living out the future before it gets here. And Jesus is very clearly telling his followers, his children, don't focus so heavily on the future. You're living it out before it gets here. And that's not the way I have laid out this plan for you. That's not the way our earthly life has been created. We cannot live out the future before it gets here because it's not here. We've got to deal with what's here today. Most of your stress when it comes to decision making, I think, is a misunderstanding of God's will. Most of the stress that we have, most of the anxiety and the sleeplessness that comes with decision making and about our future is a misunderstanding of God's will. You think that God has burdened you with the task of figuring out the future before it gets here. And that's not what God's will is all about. I want you to notice in the scripture that Jesus is talking, and I'll give you some more in just a minute, especially from 1 Thessalonians 5, that that's not what God's will is all about. It's not about, about you figuring out the future before it gets here, or figuring out this secret plan or will that God has for you. So what's God's will all about? Well, of course Jesus is going to tell you. Look at the next two verses. But seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Verse 34, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. 
each day has enough trouble of its own. And as Jesus said, each day has enough trouble of its own, everybody listening to him said, amen, right? Preach, Jesus. That's what they said, because you know that's true. Every single day has enough trouble of its own. But you notice in 33 and 34, you get a synopsis of what God's will is about. Today has enough trouble for today. Don't spend so much tr time trying to unlock this future thing. Don't waste your time, waste your energy, waste your efforts, and especially don't waste your allegiance in trying to unlock this future stuff. The question, am I doing God's will, has nothing to do with big thoughts of your future. And that's different than you probably have heard. And maybe it's not different than you've heard, but it's different than the assumption that we live in. Because I think this is a trick of the devil to get us to kind of think that God's will is this paralyzing, huge plan thing that's too big for us to get, and we should be fearful of God's will, and we should be scared that we're going to make the wrong decisions. Because guess what he can do? He can just get you to be scared and not move. He can get you to be, what's the, the old adage is, is if he can't get you to be bad, he'll get you to be busy. Why? Because busy people are distracted. Busy people end up getting paralyzed when big decisions need to be made because they're so focused on all these other things. Don't spend so much time trying to unlock this. God's will is a daily decision, is what Jesus is saying. Following God's will is a daily decision. Will you seek his kingdom first today or your kingdom first? That's a synopsis of what Jesus is saying is God's will. Will you seek his kingdom first today? Because that's really all you've got. Or will you seek your own kingdom today? You ready for it? Let me give you God's will. It's not some secret master plan you've got to figure out ahead of time. God's will for your life is growth in Christ likeness. That's God's will for your life. In every future decision, in every future thing that's going to come up, long term, short term, that's God's will for your life. It is you increasing in, growing in Christ's likeness. Now, some of you may say, well, Adam, I just, I need more than that. You know, like, I hear what you're saying, but I need a little more than that. All right, let me give you some specifics. If you turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm going to give you some specifics. There is no more specific verse in the Bible on God's will than what we're about to read. And it's three verses, all in one. And I never get, I never get to put three verses in one slide on the screens. So this is very exciting. Let me show you. Rejoice always. Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Hmm. Don't say a whole lot about making big future decisions, does it? Doesn't say a whole, about, a whole lot about what career path you choose or what second career path you choose. Or, I mean, it, it doesn't even say anything about who you marry. It doesn't say anything about the state that you live in or where you retire to. Um, it just basically says rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. You want to know what God's will for your life is? Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. There's God's will for your life. And what's beautiful if you pair these two scriptures together is that's something you actually can do today. That is not something you have to prepare for in the future. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you can prepare that much for that particular God's will in the future. That's a choice that you make today. Today I'm going to choose to rejoice. I'm going to choose to pray. I'm going to choose to be joy joyful. I'm going to choose to talk to God. And then I'm going to choose to give him thanks for everything that happens today. That's God's will for your life. Growth in Christ's likeness. You know, that can be kind of confusing for us, can't it? Because you go, well, hold up, hold up, man. That sounds just too simple. I know, I know, right? It does. But that, that's kind of confusing because you may be thinking to yourself, well, Adam, I thought God's will was going to tell me how many kids I was going to have and whether or not to stay at my current job or quit my job or go to another job. Or whether, or I thought God's will was going to tell me whether to go into ministry or not, or to date this guy, or to go on this mission trip, or to participate in this that the church said or not, or take a chance on this FPU thing they keep talking about, or take a chance on, here's the big chance people take at our, our church. This is like jumping off the cliff. Get into a small group. I thought God's will was going to kind of tell me that stuff, and all you're talking about is today's stuff. What Jesus said, and what Paul is now saying is, 
Quit putting your effort there. Quit putting your effort on tomorrow. Put your effort on today. What's worth your energy, your effort, and what you losing sleep over is, are you joyful always? Are you giving thanks? Are you consistently connecting with God in prayer? Are you speaking to him? That's what's worth you losing sleep over. What's worth you losing sleep over is, am I, am I joyful in my life? Am I thankful for what God's giving me, doing for me, providing for me? Am I thankful for the hardships and the good things that are happening? Am I connecting with him today? Like that stuff you should lose sleep over. That's worth your focus because that's God's will for your life. Growth in Christ's likeness, right? Rejoicing always, praying continually, and giving thanks in all circumstances. I don't think you can chop that verse up in any other way. You know, what's cool is, is this is a little aside, but pray continually is its own verse. So you want to memorize some scripture today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Pray continually. Isn't it amazing that you can know you're in God's will if you're doing that? You know what's funny about that verse, and here's what struck me today, just today when I was reviewing my notes, um, and I try not to ever add anything on the day of, but what struck me was is every time I cannot sleep, um, you hear that old adage of counting sheep, that never works, because who counts sheep, and why are they jumping over my bed, you know, and are they going to poop on me, or what, what, I don't understand the sheep thing. You know what, you know when I sleep, you know what makes me go to sleep, is when I start praying. If I actually start praying and keep going, I will literally fall asleep mid-prayer a couple minutes into it. I wonder if that has anything to do with 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Praying continually is in God's will. And when we do that, we begin to increase faith. We begin to increase trust, which then makes us not lose sleep. I think it's interesting. You know, what's funny is, is there's been some times in my life that I've been incredibly burdened not to sleep like it was from God to get up. And you know what it was always to do? Every single time when there was this burden to get up in the middle of the night, guess what it was to do? Pray. A couple of weeks ago, on a Saturday night, I didn't go to sleep. I tried. I laid in the bed, and then it didn't work. And so about 45, 50 minutes into it, I felt God saying, get up. And so I got up. And so I did some weird stuff because I was trying to figure out what to do at 2 o'clock in the morning. You know, nothing good's on television. And so I made a quiche, right, which is really weird for me to do. And then, and then I, I showered and I shaved. And, I, um, and before I watched the sun come up, which is, you know, you, I felt like Jesus was about to come back, that I was watching the sun come up. I just had this pull, this feel to get down on my knees and pray. I think that's what God woke me up for. You know, that next day, that was a Saturday night. You know, I felt better that Sunday morning just a few weeks ago than I have felt in years. And I think it's because something like that, being in God's will, it's okay to lose some sleep over that. It's all about faith building and trust building, not about decreasing the fear. And knowing what God's will is, is really important, but it ain't some secret magic eight ball corn maze thing that you've got to go through with God sitting back watching to see if you figure it out. What Jesus and Paul are saying right there is, quit putting your effort there in the future. Look, there's a much bigger dream under all those fears. It's a much, much bigger dream there. God's main purpose for you is not what you do. It's who you become. And so when you're paralyzed by these decisions of being in God's will, You've got to understand that the big dream under there is not going to be what you do in the future. It's going to be who you become. That's the God-sized dream that's underneath it all. It's not what you do. It's who you become. You know, when our kids are little, little we make uh, every single decision for them. Like we have to, or they'll die. We make every decision for them when they're little. And then it kind of continues even when they start walking, we make the decisions for them where they're going to walk, what's safe for them, what's not. We put out all kinds of baby gates that trip you up in the middle of the night, and 
we lock cabinet doors that then you can't figure out how to get in, but your three-year-old can. It's just funny how it works. We do all kinds of stuff to control and make the decisions for them. And then as they begin to get older, even though we try to make the decisions for them, it's impossible. You can't make all their decisions for them. And, and as my kids are getting older, I'm starting to realize that my will for their life was never making their decisions. My will for their life was never in every decision that they make. My will for my kids' lives overall is not what they do. What I realized as a young father now is my will for their life is really who they become. It's not what they do. And I could care less, which is, which is funny to say, but I could care less whether my daughter is someone who teaches kids in the school system or is working on space stuff at NASA. I could care less if she becomes the person that I know she's meant to become. If she really is on the inside who God has made her and created her and loved her to be, I could really care less what she does. It's all about what she becomes or who she becomes. The great commandment from Jesus is really simple. And if you go to Union, you should know it. It's love God, love people. Where we get that from? Well, some, some folks were trying to trip Jesus up, and so they asked him, what's the greatest commandment? Because they thought if he gives one, that it invalidates the others, and it messes him all up. And, and Jesus just kind of spins that, man. And he says, he says, it's love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. What we say around here is love God, love people. Love God, love people. Do you think that Jesus would say, that these are the most important, and that not be God's will for your life? I mean, do we really think that Jesus would say that this is the most important thing to do, and that not be God's will? That you could be doing those, take the wrong job, and be out of God's will because of some future decision? No, I don't think so. You can do that. You can love God and love people. You can do that in any situation or context and still be in the center of God's will. You mean to tell me, Adam, that if I choose this job instead of that one, and it's the wrong one, I'm still in God's will? You can be. Absolutely. And there's a lot of freedom in that. There's a lot of freedom. So in other words, the decisions you make today about whose kingdom you're going to uplift is much more important than what job you take in the future. Much more important. Because you can love God, love people in any situation, in any context, and you can still be in God's will. Why? Why? Because his will is about who you become, not what you do. The sooner you get this, the sooner you'll grasp this, the more freedom you'll experience as a Christ follower. The sooner you get this, then the focus is today being as like to Christ as I can be. Growing in him in every aspect that I can make happen. Learning to love like him, learning to be like him, learning to lead like him, all those pieces. And, and I'm going to focus on that today. And don't you think, because so I'm asking myself this question too, don't you think that if you focused on that that day, that you're in God's will that day and he will help guide the decision making and the process in the future? Don't you think that if you make the wrong decision about some job or some relocation or anything, that in that moment when you get to that decision, don't you think that you could do this and still be in God's will? I do. I really do. And as someone who struggles deeply with anxiety, someone who struggles a lot with the future of the, the, the unknown stuff, the, the, the future decisions, man, I can tell you there's a lot of freedom in this. There's a lot of freedom to know that just like those birds, just like those lilies, that God is taking care of those needs, that those things are on his shoulders, that the future is his, not ours. And I think it's real important to remember that, that the future is his, it's not ours. He ain't given it to you yet. It's his. What we have is today. And so my prayer for you as we kind of work through this whole notion of trusting God more, building our faith, is that you would really start to discern and figure out 
that God's will for you is not some big complex corn maze in the sky. It's much simpler than that. And it's so freeing to know. I mean, think about today. If you were looking for next steps today, here it is. I know I can be in God's will if I rejoice today, if I pray today, and if I give thanks in all circumstances today. I'm in God's will. And I'm telling you, when you're in God's will, when you're sitting in the center of God's will, that's what we always talk about, right? The center of God's will, here it is. When you're sitting in the center of God's will, pretty much anything that comes, even if you have no idea what to do about it, you're in good shape. You're in great shape. Lose sleep over that. Not over some random future decision that you have to make. I'm not saying they're not important. I'm not saying not consult God. But you get in his will, those things begin to take care of themselves. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. You focus on his kingdom first. You focus on him and your relationship with him and growing in your likeness with Jesus. And those things, quoting Jesus, will take care of themselves. Let me pray with you real quick. Lord, I love you today, and I praise you for your word, and I thank you for things that you put in the word for people like me. I thank you that you've thought ahead, that you've planned ahead of words that we would need to read and know, that you know where we're going to struggle before we've ever struggled there. You know the human condition, God, and so you prepare ahead of time to be very clear and simplistic about what we need to do to love you and to love people. So God, I pray that you'll just kind of just start a movement here today that'll probably happen at night. That as we cling to what your will really looks like, you begin to free us to sleep while you take care of the future. I know, God, without a shadow of a doubt that if I am in your will like this, that I will make the right decisions in the future with you. I know it. It may not feel like it in the moment, and it may look all out of sorts at cer certain times, but if I'm in your will like this, if I'm seeking your kingdom first, if I am growing in my Christ-likeness, I'm all right. I'm better than all right. I'm good. Really what I am is free. And so, Lord, I pray that you will create some freedom here today, that you'll set some hearts at ease knowing what your will truly is. Create in us, Lord, a pure heart. Create in us, God, people, a group, as families, and as a church that are really sitting in the center of your will today, right now. We trust you with all the future stuff. We are much more valuable than the lilies of the field or the birds of the air. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen.